What's the difference? How does the second orbital starship differ from the first one? Blue Origin is back, European Rocket is in big trouble, and the FCC issues the first ever penalty for space trash. My name is TJ, welcome to What About It, let's jump right in. Starship updates. The second launch is getting close, however people have doubts. Can Starship make it this time? Are we anticipating another explosion? Have they actually changed anything between the flights? Hopefully this deep dive will help calm your nerves. Come on. We have no time to waste. We're here at the launch pad where the second orbital Starship is ready and waiting for action. Even though Elon Musk says it's got over a thousand new tweaks, at first glance, it kind of looks like its older sibling. However, if you look a bit closer, you can spot some interesting differences between the two orbital stacks. Let's play a bit of a spot the difference game, starting from the top. Ship 24 is on our left and Ship 25 is on our right. First off, did you notice that Ship 25 is missing black paint on its nose? Why is that? Some people say it's just for show, especially since Ship 24's paint got all scuffed up. Others think it might have been a special layer to protect the prototype from plasma during re-entry. But perhaps SpaceX thinks Ship 25 won't make it that far. As we move a bit lower, you can see the spots that had the hooks used for lifting the prototypes. They used a tool, hilariously called the squid, to place these big guys on their pads. These attachment points are always removed and passed right up before the flight. Then there are these two pressure valves, one for oxygen, the other for methane. Right below them, there are two pressure relief vents. Now, if you're scratching your head about the difference between the two, don't worry, it's a common question. Those pressure valves, think of them like a nozzle on a balloon. They let SpaceX release gas from the tanks, kind of like letting some air out of a balloon. They can control it manually or let Starship's computer handle it. Now, the pressure relief vent, on the other hand, is our safety buddy. Imagine if you kept blowing up that balloon and couldn't let any air out of it. It'd pop, right? Well, same idea here. When the cryogenic repellent heats up, it turns into a gas and the pressure builds and this vent steps in to prevent a pop in case things get out of control. Fun fact, during a static fire of the SN8 prototype, things got super tense when SpaceX lost control of the pressure. Fortunately, then a little burst disc, think of it as a one-time use pin for that overblown balloon, saved the day by releasing all of the pressure. Moving down the ship, you'll see the forward flaps, which require no explanation, not much further than you've got that SpaceX logo. It's there just to look cool, and that's about it. But check this out, just next to the big X, two metal pieces, they're not decorations, they're used as anchor points for the flap chains, keeping them in place, especially when strong winds want to play tug of war. Playing with mother nature is never a good idea. See those six hexagons shapes below the logo, they're not just there to look fancy. They're the ship's communication antenna, setting telemetry back to ground control. Further down, there's the payload bay door. Ship 24 and 25 have a bit of a difference here. Ship 25's door has additional reinforcements, but ultimately it doesn't really matter as they're actually sealed shut, likely due to stability issues. Further along, there is a special part, the payload bay access hatch. That lets the crew get inside to work on the prototype. On ship 25, they've moved this door closer to the rocket's leeward side. Another fun fact, this hatch doubles as an antenna for Starlink, which we're hoping will stream video from space soon. To the side, there's another safety feature, a press relief vent, but this one's for the big methane tank. Around the middle of the ship at the forward dome, you'll notice some changes between the two prototypes. Ship 25's got a different stringer pattern, which you can tell by the welding marks, Around here, there are two raceways. One is a ship's electrical backbone handling power and data. The other takes care of some more technical stuff like autogenous tank pressurization. A bit below that, there are two methane pressure valves. Interestingly, they're closer to the ship's heat shield now, and we're not quite sure why. Below them, there's a hatch for accessing the methane tank and a special box, the flight termination system. This is where they put in explosive charges to safely end the flight if things go south. As we've seen in the previous launch, it sometimes doesn't work, but hopefully that won't be an issue again. On the ship's sides, there are two cold gas thrusters to help maneuver it in space, but SpaceX wants to change things up in the future. They're thinking of swapping these out entirely for something called Olage thrusters. They come with bell-like covers and are located just below the cold gas thrusters. So what's the difference? Instead of using additional tanks with gas for thrusters only, why not just use the gas that has to be released anyway due to the propellant boil off? Super clever idea, but also saves precious mass in space. This means you can fly more mass to orbit. Close to the heat tiles, there's another pair of pressure valves this time for the oxygen tank. Moving to the bottom, we reach the aft flaps. They look pretty similar on both ships. However, an interesting difference. 
Chip 24's flaps were painted on the inside, but Chip 25's weren't. Perhaps it's the same case with the nose cone paint. Both ships have their oxygen tank access in the same spot. In the aft section, there's a special plate with connectors known as the quick disconnect panel. It connects the prototype to the orbital tank farm, providing propellant and power using the special arm on the orbital launch integration tower. Next, these are known as engine chill vents. But what is an engine chill? Now that's a good question. It's procedure to make sure the engine is nice and cool before it starts. If they didn't do this, the hot engine could get damaged by the cryogenic propellant. When you see venting out of these, it's a hint that the engines are about to fire. The most significant change between ship 24 and 25, these new holes at the bottom of ship 25. They're a part of the upgraded engine section purge system. It uses CO2 to displace any oxygen or methane to make sure that the engines don't catch fire during the flight. With the ships covered, let's peek at the boosters. Booster 7 and 9 might have a whole new design on the inside, but what about the outside? They're surprisingly similar. The most eye-catching part is obviously the hot staging ring. Since it wasn't on ship 7, we really can't compare them. Beneath that, there are four black fins and a pair of load points used for lifting. These points are crucial, as they're what Mechazilla uses to pick up the Super Heavy. They're also part of the return plane, as the Mechazilla will aim to catch these points. Contrary to a popular belief, the grid fins are not sturdy enough to do the job. Further down, below the heavily reinforced forward dome, you'll find two methane ullage thrusters. These come in handy in the thinner parts of the atmosphere, where the fins aren't much help. Both Super Heavies have pipes for autogenous pressurization, which rely on Raptor engine gases to keep the tanks pressurized. The pipes stretch all the way down the engine section. As we move down, there's an intriguing spot beneath the load points. This is what we call stabilization points. The arm of Mechazilla plugged them in to provide stability when lifting the prototypes. Oddly enough, this area is covered with a putty-like substance, though its purpose to us remains a mystery. Delving deeper, we hit the common domes level. It's the part that separates the oxygen and methane tanks. Here you can spot the methane access hatch, which differs in location between the two. On booster 9, it's to the right of the quick disconnect plate. Nearby, there's the flight termination system box, or FTS, the one that blasted a hole in booster 7 during a flight without affecting the rocket's course. A touch below, you'll find the ullage thrusters for the liquid oxygen. There's a matching set on the opposite side, and by now you should know what these are for. Between the two prototypes, the thrusters seem to differ mainly in the length and tilt of their bell-shaped covers. Next, we see the booster chines, which help with airflow and component protection. Inside these are tanks that store the gas needed for spinning up the inner ring of the 13 engines. On booster 9, they're slightly elongated compared to those on booster 7. That's because booster 9 boasts an extra CO2 tank for the aforementioned purging system. The chines also now sport Starlink antennas. Down at the base, aside from the oxygen access hatch, there are two major modifications that stand out. Notice anything different in Booster 9? That's right, it's missing those two large units Booster 7 used to have. These house the hydraulic power systems, which were responsible for gimbling the Raptors. However, due to its unreliability, SpaceX shifted to a more efficient electronic system. Moreover, Booster 9 has additional vents in its lower section, similarly like Ship 25. These are part of the enhanced engine purging system. While Booster 7 did have a system in place for the same purpose, it wasn't as powerful and lacked these vents. And there you have it, the key distinctions between the two orbital stacks. Whether you've gained a new insight or just jogged your memory a bit, I hope you found this comparison entertaining. Do you think that with these upgrades, the second orbital starship has a chance to survive the flight? Share your thoughts below. We'd love to hear them. Also, you might have noticed that our Y Plus episodes are now on this channel. This is on purpose. We're trying to give you as much real-time Starship updates as possible. You'll still get our Tuesday and Friday episodes. Nothing is changing there. And guess what? We have even more content coming shortly. Now here's Felix, who's got some interesting news about another launch provider, Blue Origin, who's working with the FAA to get approval to fly again. Quick heads up, YouTube might have unsubscribed you without your knowledge. Not kidding, they seem to do this frequently. Very important task, double check that subscribe button so that you don't miss our updates. While you're checking, hit the like button and consider becoming a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. Everyone gets the same perks regardless of your contribution. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, now including aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. The next flyover will likely happen on the day you watch this episode. No matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. The link to our Patreon page is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help fulfill dreams for our team. We can't thank you enough. You rock. Shifting over to SpaceX's main rival, let's talk about Blue Origin. They are not just dreaming of reaching orbit, they are also diving deep into somewhat affordable space tourism. 
If you've been dreaming of a quick trip to space right now, there are only two options, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin. Virgin Galactic has this cool plane called Spaceship 2, which after soaring high up glides smoothly back to Earth, very elegant. On the other hand, Blue Origin gives you the classic vertical rocket experience with their new Shepard. Both of these rides promise an unforgettable journey above the 80 km line that NASA and the US call space. But New Shepard goes an extra mile, or 20, crossing the 100 km mark, which most countries around the world consider the true edge of space. It is a very gradual decrease of atmosphere anyway, defining the edge of space has always been somewhat of a hot topic. Blue Origin's capsule is like a mini party in space, fitting up to six people. Though with everyone on board, it looks a bit packed. Virgin Galactic's Spaceship 2 can technically take eight, but in reality half of those are the crew, leaving room for just three or four tourists. 2022 was a roller coaster for Jeff Bezos and his Blue Origin team. They were launching left, right and center, making it look like Virgin Galactic was eating their dust. But then on September 12, 2022, everything changed. The new Shepard 3 booster, mated with a capsule full of science gear for NASA, faced a hiccup on its NINTH flight just a minute after takeoff. The good news? Its escape system worked and the important payload safely touched down minutes later. Before we get to the bad news, here's a word from today's sponsor. While we're daydreaming about Starship, let's chat about something a little closer. Like how the internet seems to know way too much about us, right? You know those annoying emails or when random sites just get you? That's because some sneaky folks online are piecing together your every click. But imagine having a digital buddy looking out for you. Say hello to our partner Incogni and goodbye to robocalls, spam emails and targeted advertising invading your digital space. Think of Incogni as your online wingman, having your back, making sure your personal stuff stays personal and sorting out any drama. It is basically like your online best friend. Simply sign up, empower Incogni and let them work their magic. They even provide success reports. And there is more. The first 100 people to use my exclusive promo code Felix at incogni.com slash Felix will enjoy a massive 60% discount instead of 20. Join Incogni today and take control of your digital journey. Protect your privacy and help what about it at the same time? Incogni.com slash Felix. So now that your bad news is disappearing, how about the bad news for Blue Origin? The booster couldn't be saved as it smashed into the ground. This led to a big investigation, which has just now wrapped up. They nailed down the issue to structural wear caused by hotter than usual temperatures. In simple words, the engine's nozzle couldn't take the heat and gave in. Piecing together what went wrong took more than a year and together with the FAA they've now identified 21 actions to ensure this doesn't happen again. A year for such a small rocket. This really shows how quickly things with the FAA go when it comes to Starship. They'll have to tick off each and every item on this list to get the green light for future launches. Unfortunately, these actions are not available for public view. And no, I doubt Jeff Bezos will be tweeting out that checklist anytime soon. The Blue Origin team has rolled up their sleeves and declared their intention to give that unfortunate payload from the NS-23 mission another ride to space. The FCC recently gave them a communications license for one flight, suggesting a launch window from December 1st this year to February 1st, 2024. This time the FCC document does indeed point to a launch date, so let's hope that Blue Origin gets back in the space game as fast as possible. What is not going to fly anytime soon though is the European Space Agency's Vega C rocket. Here is why. Today's European rocket scene isn't quite the powerhouse it used to be. In the past, if you were itching to send something up using a European rocket, you typically had two choices. Ariane 5 for the big hauls and Vega for the smaller payloads. Vega had a shining reputation as a reliable satellite launcher, but in 2019 that image took a hit. Out of nine flights from that period, three went haywire. 
One mishap led to a jaw-dropping $411 million insurance claim for the Falcon i1 launch. The biggest such claim ever. Another blunder, believe it or not, was because someone plugged in a control cable the wrong way. That's wow, how do you even let this happen? Despite these hiccups, ESA pressed on advancing to the next phase with their Vega C rocket variant. Think of Vega C as a cooler, more flexible cousin of the original Vega rocket. It is like a Swiss army knife, allowing for various modifications to carry different types of payloads. For example, a cluster of small satellites or a mix between big and small sets. Also, its first stage is powered by the P120C engine, the same muscle that will be used as a side booster for the Ariane 6. That is pretty neat because it means making these rockets gets a bit easier and streamlined. Everything was looking peachy with Vega C's first successful flight in July 2022, but come December things took a turn. The rocket failed to reach orbit, which meant that the payload re-entered and burned up in the atmosphere. After some detective work, they found out that the second stage motor, the Sapphire 40, didn't perform as expected, losing its chamber pressure and ultimately not providing the performance needed to reach orbit. The culprit? A piece called the throat insert. It's the narrowest part in the engine that gives the escaping gases a turbo boost, accelerating them up to supersonic speeds, which generates thrust. That part cracked mid-flight, causing the engine to lose its thrust. The solution? Whip up a new insert. But surprise, surprise, during a test things didn't go as planned. It seems the new insert didn't play nice with the current nozzle design, causing more engine drama. Long story short, the nozzle has to be redesigned to work with the new insert. Even though they are saying we might see Vega C fly again in late 2024, I am placing my bets on 2025. Fortunately, ESA still has two classic Vegas lined up. One is set to blast off on October 7th, so by the time you're watching this, those satellites could be flying above us. ESA needs to speed up. Now, speaking of space and orbits, here's a juicy tidbit. Guess what? The FCC recently slapped someone on the wrist for littering in space. Seriously. Back in 2002, the Ariane 3 rocket sent up a satellite. Echo Star 7. This space TV set brought shows to people down in the US. Dish Network, the company behind Echo Star 7, originally thought the satellite would serve for 12 years. But guess what? It kept going strong, raking in profits for an extra 8 years. Come 2012, Dish Network Pinky promised the FCC to tuck the satellite away in what's called a graveyard orbit by May 2022. So what's a graveyard orbit? Let me explain. Imagine this, sending stuff to geostationary orbit which hangs around 35,000 kilometers or 21,750 miles above Earth isn't a walk in the park. It's a costly maneuver that requires a lot of fuel. Now to pull such a satellite back into Earth's atmosphere to burn up safely, that's an even bigger task. So scientists and engineers around the world decided on a retirement home for old satellites. A zone about 300 kilometers or 185 miles above the regular geostationary orbit. It's really kind of like a cosmic retirement home. Moving a satellite there is pretty fuel-friendly, using roughly what a spacecraft would need for three months to chill in its regular spot. Placing them there ensures that they won't be a hazard to other satellites for a good while. In fact, geostationary satellites stay in space almost forever. It's basically cheaper and easier to boost them up rather than to drag them down. But here is where Dish Network tripped up. When it was go time for Echo Star's retirement, it turned out the satellite was running on fumes. Instead of making it to the full 300 kilometers or 185 miles above, it only climbed up to 122 kilometers or 75 miles. And the SEC? Not thrilled! They slapped Dish Network with a fine marking a first of its kind for not properly parking a satellite. They got a parking ticket. Now on the surface it may sound like Dish got their pockets pinched with a $150,000 fine. But hold on, in just one quarter of this year Dish's profits were a whopping $200 million. 
Doing the math, it seems like they found it more economical just to pay up and use the satellite longer rather than send it to its rightful retirement home. It's a start in talking the growing issue of space clutter, but I am hoping future penalties really hit where it hurts, making companies think twice about their space trash. If things stay in geostationary orbit basically forever, if not properly parked or deorbited at the end of their life, this will become a huge problem very soon. Find them hard, FCC. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> No. I'll do that again. Uh. <laughs>